fantastic. All righty, welcome everybody to today's edition, June 6th um, of the Cardia Working Group under Hyperledger Labs. We're excited today to have a presenter and we'll get into that in just a minute before we have a couple of housekeeping items um, that includes our antitrust policy. So we are not talking about specific business opportunities here, you know, financial gain and things like that. Um, we're, we're talking about that at a more general level. If anybody has concerns, uh, please let us know. You can, you can email me or there are some ways to report that through Hyperledger directly. Similarly, our code of conduct, which is linked in our meeting notes, I'll chat this to you guys. These are community notes, so feel free. Uh, to participate or correct. Also, you can tell me to correct as we go, if that's helpful. But our code of conduct is, is really that we're an inclusive community. We encourage everybody to have a voice. If anybody feels like they're they're not getting the voice that they, they would like to have here, please, again, you can reach out to me as a, as a co-chair or um, again, through Hyperledger to, to escalate an issue. Ken, who is our other co-chair, uh, unfortunately had a death in the family, so he's not able to join us today. We hope that he'll be able to take care of those things with his family and return soon. Um, and so that takes care of our housekeeping items. Does anybody want to introduce themselves today? It's maybe been a while. I can go first because I know we're talking about some very specific health things as co-chair. My name is Keila Shatskin. I'm based in New York. I work in health data um, and operations, sort of the intersection of healthcare data and operations, uh, primarily in the health information exchange space. And I've been doing so for a very long time at this point. Um, I do that both in New York and in other states across the US. Um, and so this obviously is very close to my heart as a data exchange method for healthcare data. Rai, did I miss something you want to chime in? Uh, no, I was just raising my hand. To introduce uh, yourself. For introduction. Fantastic. So, so that's Go that's ahead. what I usually ask people to do is if you have a comment to make, you know, please raise your hand. Um, so uh, I'm Rai Jones. I'm a community architect here at the Linux Foundation. I've been working on Hyperledger since before it was Hyperledger. And uh, I, I was working with Cardia when they were over in LFPH, um, which went through some turbulence. So I'm really glad to see that Cardia has moved to a Hyperledger lab and is working on becoming uh, you know, what it promised to be. So I'm, I'm really glad. If you need any support, I'm on Discord. You know, please reach out. And we're forever grateful for your support, um, Rai. We really feel it here. So thank you. Would anybody else like to introduce themselves? Um, I will just because it's been a while. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. My name is Helen Garneau. I am. Uh, I do uh, the marketing work here at Cardia um, in conjunction with some of my colleagues, uh, Tim Spring and Trevor Butterworth, um, and the community. Um, I also do marketing for Indicio um, and was there when Cardia was born, <laughs> uh, I guess, last year? No, two years ago now. Three years ago. 2019. 2019. 2020. 2020. 2020. Anyways, um, so again, happy to see it grow, happy to see, um, you know, us move forward and, and be part of the Hyperledger Foundation community. Um, I'm also the Hyperledger membership marketing chair. So that's um, a role that I was elected in by the um, kind of dues paying members of Hyperledger and um, all the all the groups um, that are part, part of the community. And so if there's anything I can do to help support, uh, yeah, just the visibility of Cardia, I have many, many hats uh, that I wear that would support that effort. So um, if anybody has any ideas, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I think Trevor might have an update on white paper potentially. So we might want to add, just grab some time at the end for that um, at some point. Sure. Okay, so then um, just for an update, we, we've migrated all of our right housekeeping, we've migrated all of our things to the Hyperledger platform so that we're more integrated. It's been super helpful. Like, as I mentioned, we're eternally grateful for the support that we're getting here. Um, and so I've left the minutes um, about some of those transition things. If you're, you know, if you come to late to the party, there's some cheat sheets about sort of what's changed and how we're operating and where to find things. You can see those here. Um, so I'll leave those. We'll probably take them out moving forward. 
but just as a reminder, that's there for you. And we're taking notes in the Hyperledger Labs uh, space now, which I've linked in our chat. So today we are very excited um, to have a speaker participate and join and talk about some of the healthcare vital stats space. I'm not going to do it justice in terms of the breadth and scope of what we're going to learn about today and how it intersects with the work we're doing here at Cardia. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce Sarah and to encourage um, participation from our community. If you have questions as we go through today's discussion, feel free to throw your hand up and we'll get that asked or you can put it in the chat box and I'll be monitoring turning that through the course of today. So without further ado, Sarah, do you want to introduce your, yourself and, and Ivan? Sure. Hi, I'm Sarah Samus. I work at GCOM. We're a um, primarily state and local government um, product, software product and IT services company. Um, and we work with um, mo states, many states across the country. Um, and um, one of our um, product areas that we focus on is uh, vital records issuance and management. Um, and then we also have been working on uh, digital identity solutions using verifiable credentials. So we, um, after talking with um, Ken and Helen and Kayla previously um, and Heather, um, we were invited to come speak to you guys and go through a little bit more of our um, design process on the vital records use cases for verifiable credentials. Um, the Vital Records National Association um, has sort of made an, an, a, a goal for its membership that all of the vital records jurisdictions across the country will figure out how to do at least some kind of pilot level um, digital certificate issuance by 2026. And um, we, feel really strongly along with the Cardera community that um, decentralized identity should be a component of that solution and process because it is um, more secure um, and, and better user experience for constituents. So let me share my screen. Yeah. Um, and... Is it is it loading? It's thinking about it. Hmm. Let me let me try. Is it didn't work? Let me try again. It's not a presentation without some technical glitches. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Can people see it now? We are with you. We're in the Great. PowerPoint view. Great. Okay. Um, how do I use the keyboard to do the screen uh, slide view? Could... Does anyone remember? <laughs> if you, because you can, right? yeah, there's a little it's icon that right looks like right. a screen being pulled down at the bottom right. There we go. Or there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. We're with um, you. So first, I was going to talk a little bit about what vital records are and how um, they are somewhat unique in the United States compared to a lot of other nation nations and um, international countries. Um, so vital records are a form of um, identity credentials. Um, that is true both in the U.S. and abroad. Um, they're used for a range of um, identity verification when you go to get other types of identity documents, including your social security card and your passport and your driver's license. So they are one of the foundational identity credentials in the United States. However, <laughs> they are not issued at the federal level. In the US, they are issued at the local jurisdiction level and there are 57 state and territorial vital records offices across the country. Um, there are 57 because some states have delegated some of this authority to counties and cities. And then we have our US territories, including Guam, 
American Samoa, Virgin Islands, that kind of thing. Um, the states share all of their vital records data with the federal government um, through the CDC and the National Center for Health Statistics um, cooperative program. So the federal government helps supports and makes investments in state um, vital records IT systems so that they can do this data sharing um, and that kind of stuff. Any questions about that? This is this is very unique to the United States. Most other countries have vital records issued at the national level. And this sort of federated nature makes it a little harder um, to do sort of uh, standardization and interoperability quickly <laughs> across the jurisdiction. So I think, um, Kayla, you're super familiar with these types of challenges from working with healthcare providers on HIEs and, and some of those similar challenges occur at the vital records jurisdiction level. NAPSIS does have a bunch of tools that help with that in a way that your HIEs also do that, um, sort of matching and consolidation. Um, so there, there are investments in the vital records technology space that have helped to um, massage and address these challenges. And I happen to live in one of the wonderful states that has two because right. there is a city, New York City Department of Health, and there is a New York State Department of Health, and they have disparate systems that do Correct. not talk to each other. In fact, yes. occasionally there's some bad blood there, <laughs> and so they don't collaborate as much as you would hope that they do. Yes. So there's all sorts of nuances, um, in, in, and I think there's also and correct me if I'm wrong, there's, there is specific state law that also unlevels the playing field across these, these yes, many each, agencies, right? Each state has its own state law that dictates how vital records should be collected and can specify um, even down to like the, the data field level, what should be collected um, and, and included in a birth and death certificate. State laws also often um, govern how much um, it costs to get a birth or death certificate. Um, but again, this is all somewhat varied by states. And the um, National Association does have a model law that it propagates for states to use in sort of drafting and updating their state legislation. It, but they can choose to go go rogue. Yes, it is please. really up to their own individual jurisdictional authority, though. Um, so in addition to this federated system, which, as we just discussed, has some data sharing and integration challenges, you also have a lot of different end users um, across all levels of government that use vital records. If we think back to the first slide where we talked about how this is an identity credential used as identity verification to get other identity credentials, you can understand how all of the um, lines in this um, high level <laughs> uh, user flow and data flow chart have um, been drawn because there's just so much interaction across different both federal and state and local jurisdictions, as well as the private sector. So we've bucketed, and this is pretty industry standard, there's, there's three primary end users of vital records IT systems and, and the, the, the systems that store your um, information that's put into your birth and death certificate. So you have your state and local jurisdiction staff you have your um, external data providers, sorry, the state and local jurisdictions after in the dark view, your external uh, data providers that enter data about birth and death, um, including people's names, their cause of death, their time of birth, time of death, all that stuff, and relationship to relatives. Um, those are all in the yellow on this diagram. And then you have the general public, when you wanna request a birth or death certificate, um, they're in the light blue here. So each of these 57 jurisdictions has to serve all of these stakeholder groups. And um, this means there's a lot of friction and interaction uh, because you have multiple end users of one system and you're trying to make that system seamless and a good user experience and also be able to produce um, the certificates in a timely fashion. Uh, the CDC has set a goal that they want 
all births ideally registered within 72 hours of birth. And I am blanking on the death um, cutoff, but during COVID, it was really important to have timely death reporting um, because that was really helping with the uh, disease surveillance and understanding um, the flow of the epidemic. So I think COVID really highlighted the need for timely death reporting. Um, and again, you can see that all of these people involved <laughs> doing all of these different data entry pieces into the different portions of the vital record system really complicates all of those processes happening quickly. We have a question from Simon. Simon, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to relay it? You're on mute, so I'm going to relay it unless you come off. Um, <laughs> so there's a question about why, why are these things not free to citizens of the U.S.? Um, is that because it's state by state? I don't know if you have any insight to that, Sarah. Um, that is a really good question. <laughs> it is definitely, um, the fee scale is set state by state. Um, I would say that, um, and I can go back and check more with the association on this, but the fees do help cover the operating costs of producing the birth and death certificate. So that money generally goes into the operating budget for the vital records division. Um, normally those are within state health departments. Um, and so there's you, all the staff here, right? The IT systems, when you're talking about paper certificates, there's um, very specific security paper with a lot of fraud protection built in in the same way your driver's licenses are continually being updated with new fraud protection methodologies. They have the similar type of fraud protection um, approaches built into vital records um, paper certificates as well. So there's all of this investment and operating cost around keeping the system safe and secure and um, able to handle the, again, as you can see from this diagram, the volume of users entering data into the system. Yeah, that including that, that there's an office, there's like people that are having to be interacted with because yes. it's not a seamless system. And again, it varies widely, but because it's not seamless, there's like an office that you have to go yes. talk to a there, person. There are almost <laughs> always um, walk-in offices where you can order a birth and death certificate because you can't do it all online. A lot of times you can't do it online for some of those um, exceptional relationship cases like adoption or um, custodial relationships where you're not a blood relative, you have to do a lot more identity verification to even be able to request the birth certificate. So they check that you're a valid requester. So there's a lot of IV upfront when requesting a birth certificate, if you have a more complicated relationship or a death certificate to the, the child or the deceased. So um, there's, a, again, a lot of resource intensive um, processes around that identity verification and fraud protection, because it, it is in one of the foundational identity documents, you don't just, you don't just want to give it out to anyone. Was there a uh, follow-up? Thank you. I, sorry, I apologize. I was on the mute. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if you know the Vital Check. This is the company that issues uh, vital credentials here in Idaho State. Uh, do you know if it's the government-owned uh, organization or is it a private organization? Um, Vital Check is a software product provided by LexisNexis, and most jurisdictions use it for, at a minimum, their order processing. So when you want to order on, an online um, birth or death certificate or over the phone um, or have a kiosk, um, the, that is generally the software system that's used to help with that process. So it's a private technical solution, but contracted by the public. Yes, health and that agencies. is common. Most states either have purchased a private technical solution or they've built their own homegrown solution. So um, I would say the more more jurisdictions have moved to the private hosted solutions or private maintained, um, even if it's not hosted by the vendor. Um, and there are there are fewer 
um, homegrown systems anymore. Because again, all of the maintenance required and the complexity and the business rules configuration, it becomes very laborious um, and expensive. So more places have moved to a, a private vendor provided solution. And I have another following question, if you don't mind. So if uh, all of the vitals checks on the territory of the United States should uh, have the same uh, architecture and uh, basically meaning that the, the, the birth certificate issued in Hawaii should not be any different from the one issued in Arkansas or Alaska, isn't it doesn't it make sense to unify the whole process and make one software solution it, that would issue would the, if you could the mandate that those processes and the content be exactly the same but again that's all set by individual state law and um, if it's not already conforming to the sort of model law minimum requirements it it does require the state to pass legislation amending and moving it closer their own law closer to that direction okay thanks yeah, so it's it's really not a unified system. There's a minimum sort of floor base that the association has set, and most states try to reach that, but there's still nuance and variation on top of it. These are great I, questions. I, I think one other thought I have is there, and, and maybe it's more of just highlighting this, that blue, which is the public, there are, also, it's not just like me personally, it may be right if I'm getting social security benefits, if I'm getting if I have life insurance, right, there's, there's private companies that also need to know right and they yes. become end users yes. as well. And I think if we go back to this, this one is the birth one, but there's one of these, this is the generic sort of use case mapping that um, I think the CDC did and I can put the link in the chat or send it as a follow up email if people are interested, this is a great overview. Um, and this use case document goes through who all of those stakeholders are and talks a little bit more about some of the clearinghouse integration systems that are similar to HIE. So this like Steve and Sam's thing in the middle here, um, that helps to do some of that um, intermediary data sharing um, work. Great. But yes, there are like on the, um, it's more obvious on the, on the um, death one in terms of the um, private users, but here all, all of the, the pink is um, private entities, not government. I mean, I guess it could be a, a hospital or a birthing center that's a public benefit corporation, like when I worked at health and hospitals, um, but all of these people in the pink are the private slash public users of um, vital records for birth certificates. Um, and then just to underscore, these are typical modules in a vital records IT system, each of these blue boxes in the middle with the white um, uh, lettering. So when you asked about vital check, the order processing one is the one that they're most prevalent in, but they also have full stack um, systems so that provide all of these modules as well. And just in full disclosure, GCOM has a COTS vital records management system. So we have a software product that does all of these functionalities. Um, so now the focus I think for you guys was really like, what does this industry mean for decentralized identity technology and distributed ledger technology? Um, so we've mapped out a couple use cases to discuss with you guys. Um, and, and we have some trust triangles to illustrate the different use cases. So, um, the first one is the medical certifier. So if we go back to this diagram, we're talking primarily about the yellow external data providers here are the ones who certify records and say like, uh, this person was born at this time and it was you know a, a regular vaginal delivery versus cesarean delivery, or this person died at this time and it was a natural cause of death versus something else. Um, so there's a way to use decentralized identity to make the certification process quicker and easier for the medical certifiers. Um, and this one is pretty interesting because it can be done, it's not so clear 
from the, the, the first glance who the, the admin is who's issuing the credentials here. So if you're, if you're a doctor or a funeral home director, generally you're licensed at the state level, but that agency that's licensing you may or may not be um, the, the health department. So you might, you might need a different agency than the health department to be your admin here. Um, and then your vital records are generally going to be in your health department. So your, your verifier is still going to be within the health department, most likely, but the admin could potentially be a different agency, um, if that makes sense. I don't know if I'm being clear here. So this this type are of you suggesting that it could be like the hospital, for example, that becomes the initiating admin because the no, it's usually like, um, for example, in New York State, the medical licensure, right? The 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 um, agency that oversees your medical license is the State Department of Education. So in in New York State's example, the admin would most likely be the State Department of Education here. And then your verifier in this case is the vital record system owned by the state health department, which says, okay, I realize that you have a verifiable credential saying that you're this licensed medical doctor. Okay, so this is this is highlighting the trust triangle of saying who's qualified correct to formally submit a yes. birth or death by yes, death. Yes, that is record. a perfect way to phrase it. Um, thank you for being so succinct. And I think again, the interesting thing is that this use case may or may not be totally controlled by one agency and might require some more interagency coordination. Um, to implement. But we like this um, use case because it is more secure. Right now, there's a lot of um, biometric data stored often um, for mobile apps that certifiers use. And we don't think that Ideally, long term, that's a great way to go because you're then centralizing storage of biometric data and it's such a high security risk. I'm sure Ivan can go into way more um, elaboration on this point. Um, so we think we're we think that trying to get the industry more interested in moving to a verifiable credential um, for medical certifiers would really accelerate security and lower costs. If you want to hear a funny story, the uh, New York City Department of Health rolled out uh, an app to people who were allowed to submit data to their vital stats, and it had facial recognition, and they had to roll it all back out because it didn't work, and they were not able to meet those timeline requirements. They couldn't mark anybody as deceased. It was a major flop. <laughs> Very painful. Ivan, you came off. Uh, you came on camera. Do you want to add? No, yeah, I was just going to add that, you know, you, you have a, a, a system with medical cert, uh, certifiers where you have a lot of different like um, systems that the, the state can't necessarily manage. You have a lot of different doctors, providers and whatnot. Um, so kind of a, a decentralized identity um, um, a solution for that makes a lot of sense um, because the state doesn't necessarily have to manage that, where if you have a centralized system, um, it becomes a, a fairly significant um, cost and an overhead burden um, on the state itself. I think one of the other interesting um, nuances to this use case, in addition to like the multiple agency coordination and the um, um, the the comments Ivan was talking about, is that the um, you might need some changes to state law because of what we were talking about earlier, where state law governs like everything about vital records collection. Essentially, if state law says you need certain types of um, identity verification for the medical certifier, you might have to amend state law or get some kind of creative legal opinion talking about how this technology, which didn't exist <laughs> um, when those laws were written, satisfies that existing state requirement. So when we think about implementation challenges, like that one also comes to my mind. Any more questions on this? But we we again see real value in this because, um, and Kayla, you worked with hospital systems. So you know that anything that saves a doctor's time or a clerk's time is like bottom line and frees up time for patient care, right? So if we can arm 
providers with the ability to use their verifiable credentials <laughs> in a quick and easy fashion on their mobile device, then they've freed up so much more time to do the things that really matter to their profession. Absolutely. So how does this fit into the next step? So you've verified the certifier of the per so this is the person who's now been rubber stamped basically to submit uh, the death record mm -hmm. to the vital stat system what are those submission protocols do they also does this then piggyback into another trust triangle for the submission process um or is this, do you this see is, this, this as them part, using a credential really, to sort of like log in? Both. It could be logging into the, the data entry portal, okay, for the vital record system. And it can also be about the submission. So you could have two potential ways to apply um, decentralized identity for certifiers. Excellent. Yeah, so I think this one you get, not only is it more secure, potentially better workflows for the um, external data providers, which helps timeliness of reporting, um, but you can also potentially get two sort of use cases out of one <laughs> application. Okay, Any, anything else? These are all great comments. They're really helping us like flesh out the the use case um, value prop as well. Okay, so then we're gonna switch to what the trust triangle looks like for the public customers, the people who are ordering the birth and death certificates. So um, here's one where it's a parent and they're getting a birth certificate copy for their child because often a birth certificate is required to do um, school enrollment for your child at the local um, school district level. So in this instance, the issuer is the health department um, office of vital records. And then the verifier is the local school district um, and there, there are already some jurisdictions, some local school districts that do online enrollment, but think about the sort of security <laughs> and um, vulnerability associated with like uploading a picture of your birth certificate to a local school district website. That's no bueno. <laughs> uh, so this switching to verifiable credentials would probably be easier from a, a resident parent perspective, and it's definitely a whole lot more secure. Um, so in this workflow, you've got your digital verifiable birth certificate credential on the parent's phone, and then the local school district can have some kind of like QR scanner that scans it, and then the child's uh, birth certificate information can get automatically ingested into their online registration system. This is also a really great use case to highlight the um, selective disclosure elements of or zero knowledge proof, whichever your school district wants to move towards um, aspect of verifiable credentials. Because if the school district just wants to know, OK, this child is of age for this grade, then that could be zero knowledge proof. And if the school district just wants to know their birth date to automatically determine the grade or and their parents' address to automatically determine their um, um, residency, um, that could also be zero knowledge proof or selective disclosure. So there, the, there's generally two forms of the birth certificate. There's the long form, which has a whole lot of information. Like it has both parents' names. It has information about the mom's health status and the type of delivery they had, um, whether there were some newborn screening health um, characteristics collected at the time of birth. And the school doesn't need all of that, nor would you want to share all of it with the school. Um, so 
the short form is generally what people use for the school and um, the again the selective disclosure functionality with a verifiable credential allows the resident to really easily uh, make sure they're only giving the short form level information or even less than the short form level information to the school district. So we really like this use case because we feel it really highlights all of the capabilities around verifiable credentials. Ivan, did you have stuff to add? Uh, not exactly. I, I think on the verifier side, it, it definitely presents a lot of value for these schools. I, I mean, a lot of times when you're applying for different school uh, you know, programs or even just the initial application into the whatever primary school it is, um, there is a lot of friction there in terms of ordering uh, physical birth certificates um, and the presentation process of those physical birth certificates. Um, so, you know, we've seen a lot of positive feedback in terms of in that application process, you know, if there is a process where you can get your birth certificate, you know, instantaneously at the same time you're applying for something, um, it just unlocks a lot of possibilities for the, the local school districts and the parents. I see Mike has his hand up. Yeah, so uh, this may be one of the most important credentials to be issued as a verifiable credential bar none anywhere in the entire world for any use case period. Um, so for example, I, I've been doing work with uh, passport credentials. That's a, a use case that actually spawned the, uh, you know, originally started with uh, vaccine records, but um, morphed into the trials in Aruba for uh, DTC passport stuff. And to get a passport, I've recently gone through the, the process with my uh, with my daughter, we had to mail her birth certificate into a federal agency and then pray that it came back, you know? And uh, so besides having the friction of receiving the birth certificate, there's the fact that, you know, do I really want to put this and trust this to the mail system? And, um, and like you were mentioning with all of the data that they may not need to know. Um, so, you know, where birth certificates are the, not only required to go to school, you need them for a driver's license and a passport, which are, you know, the the later on universal identities that people use. Um, I'd be really excited about this becoming reality. Um, is this on the horizon or is this just a really awesome presentation about um, the possibilities and the use case? We, we think it's on the horizon. Again, there was a lot of um, interest and um, we did some really great um, implementation uh, brainstorming <laughs> at the NAPSIS conference in April where this was heavily investigated. So I do think that there are a lot of, there is a lot of momentum on the vital records side right now. In addition, some states, um, and Ivan can go into more detail, are really moving towards um, their own policies and regulations around digital identity to begin with. So, Ivan, I don't know if you want to talk about Utah's yeah. law that was just passed, but there, there's a sort of this confluence, like Vital Records themselves is really interested in this, and then some states are um, approaching digital identity, you know, from a, a whole statewide policy perspective. I think there's there's a couple of different things to to talk about there. Um, you know, you mentioned that birth certificates are kind of a foundation for both passports and driver's license, and and the reality is in the United States that um, birth certificates have lagged behind driver's licenses and passports um, due to simply their portability um, in terms of how you can use the actual credential itself. And what we recognize is that you know if we can take birth certificates and digitize them in any way, even if you didn't use the centralized identity in any way, um, it makes the, the birth certificate um, and a lot of those other processes after the birth certificate, like driver's license and passports, much more efficient and much simpler. Um, and it reduces a lot of overhead and burden on both the state, um, the uh, resident, as well as anybody that wants to use it. Um, so there is a, a very significant use case for this. Um, and like Sarah was saying, you know, at, at NAFSIS, uh, this was the biggest uh, topic of discussion here was how do we bring birth certificates and all vital records into a modern age? 
Um, and yes, there are I mean, a lot of different states we've seen in Utah and Michigan and, and Rhode Island. A lot of different states are, are really trying to push uh, decentralized identity and recognizing that birth certificates are a kind of a genesis credential for just about everything. So if you can solve birth certificates, you can then use this to apply for, you know, your SNAP benefits or unemployment, or you can use this actually as um, the credential it's intended to be that kind of driver's license and passports have taken the place of. I would also add that um, the impet impetus in the field right now is even though we're behind on the vital record side compared to the DMV, sometimes it's easier to do that leapfrogging to the more advanced technology when you haven't tried to go the intermediate route first. So I feel like personally, as somebody who's worked in innovation for a while now, this might be the more ready use case because there haven't been intermediate digital identity solutions already um, piloted or rolled out. Um, and so it might be more ripe for decentralized identity to ad adoption from the beginning um, for a confluence of reasons, right? Like the cost to ledger stuff is coming down now. Um, I kind of feel like this is, we're at this moment where um, decentralized identity is very similar to the credit card chip technology where it was clearly the superior and more secure technology from the get-go, but the cost of production was so high that you haven't seen mainstream adoption until like 20 years after it was technically <laughs> physically manufacturable, right? So I feel like, again, if, if there's this sense of urgency and momentum on the state registrar side, and the state registrars have so many operational pressures on them, especially post COVID. They're short on staff. They want to like offer their staff more flexibility and remote work options to keep the staff that they have. They want to simplify their workflow and processes to be able to provide better customer experience and do more order processing. Cause again, that gets them more revenue, um, the faster they can issue more certificates. Um, and then you have the cost to use decentralized identity technology coming down and they're not tied down by an intermediate solution that they've already invested in right there's no sunk costs in some of the dmv type approaches that have already happened so we might be able to do that leapfrog in this market um, and for this use case in particular i think it's it's very appealing and um the timing might really work out Fantastic. I have one question on this flow and then we'll get to Mike's technical question one second. Um, so it, this is very interesting that you brought this one up because we've been sitting at the space where we're talking about the intersection of healthcare verifiable credentials, which isn't dissimilar from the vital stats data, but also, for example, the school based health requirements and those could be credentials. So if you start to pair these things together, you really start to see the ecosystem coming to fruition with you know the birth certificate sharing but also the immunization record sharing and etc that we've been working on in terms of conceptualizing that for cardia as our extension use case i totally agree with you and i think this school enrollment example is the perfect confluence of that where you can use the immunization credential with the birth certificate credential together to almost fully automate and and digitize the process so the parent literally doesn't have to produce any paper for the school to get their kid enrolled like that really excites me um and i feel like there's high potential here for this use case for it to be almost fully digitized going forward Right. Mike, you have a question about the technical structure. And I I heard you say selective disclosure, which would lend itself to a non-creds. But where do you see this from a technical perspective going in terms of credential formats? Do you have any read on that? Yes. Um, well, I guess no it would be the answer. So I, I guess <laughs> in, in our discussions that we've had both at NASA and kind of around the country, the focus right now is less on the, the the technical aspect of it. Like there, there really is a desire, just period, from a, a business use case to just digitize credential, or digitize vital records, um, and we've kind of pushed this decentralized method of doing that. But I don't think there is the conversation is ready yet for which standard should prevail, kind of across the United States. And the reality is, you will see stratification in different states and, and what they choose. Um, it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not one central location. Of course, there will be the recommendations from the association. 
Um, so I would say we're, we're probably not probably at least two years away from, you know, one standard emerging as what's going to be the, the standard going forward. Um, but until then, I, you know, I think for the next few years, you're probably just going to continue to see pilots happen around this space um, to where that question will get answered eventually, but I don't think is answered now. And Ivan, do you anticipate or um, maybe have nightmares about a state where uh, that doesn't get a consolidated single answer and the states go in deviating directions around their specific technical standard? In reality, I think it will happen. You will have deviation. I mean, you take even just driver's license today around the MDL standards, you see what um, Louisiana is doing um, with their kind of homegrown solution, which is super effective and works really well uh, from what I've heard in Louisiana, but isn't interoperable with other standards. And I think the reality is in the United States, you will see that. That's unfortunate. Um, we can just hope to to come together, I guess, as a, as a community and, and try to um, push one of them over time, which everyone kind of gains the most popular and traction um, is the most, you know, the most secure and best for the use case. But I think the reality is you will see stratification. It's unfortunate, but with 57 different jurisdictions, it's it's very difficult to come to one. I, I will say that there's a potential role for the federal funding aspect of vital records jurisdictions to help steer people towards the preferred standards. Um, so, um, the National um, Pro Cooperative Data Sharing Program does provide funding for the states. Um, and so they can attach some guidelines or requirements around um, the systems that share the data with the federal government for that program. And then the CDC also provides data modernization funding for federal records jurisdictions, usually on a more discretionary basis, but should they you know, really want to dictate more in this space, I think a, a grant opportunity would help move the industry in one direction if if there was consensus. I'm sure NAPSIS and the CDC folks are talking about this, um, but- which, which is the that, carrot. That provides an opportunity. I don't know how, whether there's a corollary on the DMV side um, and whether that was even a lever on the DMV side, but that is certainly a carrot lever that, the federal government could help with. Right. And it's yes. interesting. I heard you mention CDC, right? So that means that there, because CDC is heavily involved in federal standards in, in healthcare and other, you know, tangential healthcare spaces. And so there is an opportunity for some mandates potentially mm -hmm. in that flow down. Ivan, I'm so sorry. Did I cut you off? You were going to chime no, in? No, you're you're absolutely correct. And it's not just the C. I think uh, Department of Homeland Security is doing some work around this space as well um, in terms of trying to, I guess, find federal standards. I um, mean, we hope that that kind of work works with, between you know, the CDC and them as well. Um, but I guess to Mike, what Mike just put in the chat is, is going to be key. I mean, you're, we are going to need to have software that's just going to work. I mean, this, the states care about the use case and the state cares about the outcomes. Um, and, you know, they're, if they want to interoperate with another state that has a different credential, we kind of have to make it work. Um, and I think that's, I guess, early on now that we, we can kind of predict that that's going to happen based on what's happening with driver's licenses. I think we just have to be prepared to, to support whatever, whatever direction the state and the legislature goes down. Great. I just want to do a quick time check. We have about 10 minutes left. I don't know how much more, you, more how many more use cases you have here that we should um, delve into. Before we move on to the death use case, which is the one we have the least um, fleshed out so far, um, one more aspect of the birth use case is that the revocable credential um, functionality could be really applicable for birth certificates. For example, like you would, you might want to revoke the parent being able to have access to the child's birth certificate once they come of legal age. Um, so that is another functionality that we feel like really highlights the birth use case. Do you, are there also complicating factors around parental accessibility? Like if somebody's removed, um, would that be a similar application I of that think, use case? I think so. Um, we have less um, investigation into that aspect, but I do think that, yes, some of these complicated um, guardianship cases could be um, 
made easier for all involved <laughs> with a verifiable credential solution. Yeah, and, and I, Mike brought up guardianship uh, in the comments. I think that's a that's one of those. It, it's, it's been kind of interesting in discussing like how that should or shouldn't work. Um, from what my understanding and my feeling now is that it, it may not be uh, like a technical level of guardianship. I, I think what you said with the revocation and reissuance is significant. Is the reality is today in a birth certificate is the parent gets the birth certificate uh, and they, they hold on to it regardless of what happens. Um, so anything we do around guardianship is an improvement over the existing process. So this may not be an area where you need to you know, engineer you know, a, a more robust guardianship. I think just the ability to revoke and reissue is already a massive improvement over today's systems. And just to add on to what Ivan was saying, that would apply not just to guardianship, but to amendments and correction. So often, um, especially with um, different languages being spoken and um, some legacy um, credential or legacy vital records, um, there could be a lot of manual errors that require manual correction to people's names and spellings and all that stuff. And so, again, the verifiable credential where you can easily revoke and reissue could make that back and forth, like a lot of back and forth happens between the, the supervising clerks and the issuing day-to-day -day data entry clerks because of these types of things. And the public customer has to bring in, you know, proof of Evidence. all these changes all the time. And that's like a huge burden on them. Um, one of the really interesting um, edge cases that was presented at the NAPSIS conferences in April is there are people who are born in the U.S. to to non-citizen parents and then go back to their home, their parents' home country without a birth certificate uh, because the parents have never fulfilled the process or been able to get the birth certificate because they're not a citizen in the same way. So then you have an undocumented US citizen in a foreign country and the steps they have to go through to actually get the US birth certificate is incredible, very state by state, often involves tons of lawyers and representation. And so again, figuring out a, a, a verifiable credential solution would make it a lot easier for them. They're stateless people. They're they're actually like not often eligible to even enroll in school in the foreign country that they went home to with their parents because they don't have an identity um, document. So uh, there's a lot of benefits to the birth um, certificate use case. Excellent. Okay, so really quickly on the death use case, um, the issuer here is again the vital records office, generally at the health department. Um, your, you know, so your relative or, or legal representative would be the the holder um, after the deceased is gone, and then some of the. Um, Verifier use cases um, are include not just government, but as we were talking about before, a bunch of private sector functions. So um, title search companies, life insurance, um, that kind of stuff. And then government often hires um, third party services to do program integrity for benefit programs. So think about Kayla Medicaid or um, Social Security pension benefits um, for any local pensions for uh, for government, ex-government workers and their beneficiaries. So there, there's a whole industry out there that uses the death certificates to um, figure out when to terminate benefits. Um, so there, th that those would be some of the um, verifiers for the death, digital verifiable credential for death certificates. I think um, from my own experience, the, the selective disclosure is super valuable here too, because so many people don't need any detail. They just need a fact of death, which I know NAFSIS has worked on for many years. I've been engaged with that, but it's been really tricky just to say, is this person alive or not? Uh, so that they can take their appropriate follow-up action. They don't need the details of related to their death or even the date. They just need to know like, yes or no, <laughs> what happened here? Um, so that plays another role into that selective disclosure on the death scenario as well. And that people find death data to be very sensitive. That makes a lot of sense. 
um, especially like causes. We think about the mm -hmm. opioid crisis, yes. for example, right? Yep. Highlighting that yep. they had a substance use issue is super sensitive data mm -hmm. on the why they died. Yep. Or like thinking back to the AIDS um, crisis in the 80s and 90s, right? That was, that was a sensitive um, cause of death back then um, as well. Um, I think some of the exciting implementation <laughs> nuances for this one is when you think about the verifiers in, in the death certificate use case, there's a lot of heavy IT investment already in like IV for these um, um, entities. And so figuring out like what makes sense to do as like standard integrations across industry fields would be I think some of the um, interesting um, sort of scoping and implementation next steps. Excellent. And so, and there's that play in the middle again, in terms of generating the death certificate where a medically verified person had to submit yes. the reason for death. Yeah. Yeah, the, cert, the certifier use case that we talked about applies to either birth or death certificates. Excellent. Does anyone have any questions as we come to the end of our session here? Ivan, do you have anything else to add on the death use case? No, I think it's, I think it's pretty straightforward. I, I think the one thing about death certificates is that we're, what we've seen is longer, like times to delivery in terms of the death certificates as well. Like, you know, in certain states taking weeks or months to, to process those. Um, so I think just from an operational standpoint, um, there is a, a pretty intense emphasis on making those processes more efficient, um, which is significant. And the certifier use case would play heavily into that um, timeliness for the death certificate as well. Right, yeah. right, absolutely. Okay, excellent. I think this has been really wonderful, very, very critical to the conversations we've been having here in this community. And so we hope that we'll be able to connect with you guys again in the near term future, um, because I think there's a huge overlap in, in sort of what Cardia is focused on and from the health based credential and how it intersects with these vital stats credentials. So I found this very interesting. This is, this is quite possibly one of the best meetings we've had most informative. Yes, oh. had we recorded right. it. <laughs> <laughs> It was spot on. So very, very, very relevant for what we've been working on. And I really appreciate uh, what you've done. Um, I took a couple of screenshots from the of the interesting deck pictures. I don't know if that's okay to put in the meeting notes and maybe there we can just put yeah, the whole deck can, in we our- Yeah, we can give you the whole deck, a PDF of the whole deck too. Um, and then um, we'll put a link to that use case document that I was talking about as well. Um, and I don't know, Ivan, anything else you can think of we should add based on this conversation? You said there was something, uh, was it the CDC uh, use case? Is every time about the use case? Yeah, document? the use case oh. document, yeah. Right. Just bear in mind that is supposed to be a generalizable one across all 57 jurisdictions, and they all have nuances to that, all of them. <laughs> Levels in the details with these kind of things. Yeah. Yes, it always is. I think this has been really excellent and gives us a lot to think about and how we see the future and interacting in some of these spaces. So again, huge thank you to both of you. Really appreciate your time. I hope thank we'll you have you back us. soon. Definitely. And hopefully everybody has a wonderful day. I took a lot of notes. Um, people are welcome to go read them. If you have any corrections, feel free. <laughs> and um, we will talk to you all soon. In two weeks is our next meeting, June 22nd. We'll be sending out some notes on what to expect in that meeting. Excellent. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.